so first of all, just to reassure you that this isn't, um, you know, this isn't a hard sell for Newton Prep. That's not what you've come to hear, and that's certainly not what I'm going to give you. But I do think that um, certainly if any of you regularly look at things such as Mumsnet or Nappy Valley, and I, you know, I urge the greatest of caution when you look at such things, there is a real temptation to push the panic button. And I think what I would want to say to you in our short time really together, I think I want to give you two messages. The first message is don't panic because actually there's a wealth of choice out there for you when you're thinking about schools for your little children. But on the other hand, sitting alongside my don't panic message is a message that says you do need to do some thinking quite early about the school you think you would like your child to go to. So in this you know, mixed audience, really, of some of you who have got tiny little children and the whole prospect of school feels light years away, and others of you who are coming at this from, you know, from all sorts of different angles in your own lives and in your own careers, I think I'm just going to, as I say, use this, these precious few moments that we've got together to, to offer up a few thoughts um, for you to consider about schooling for your children. The first thing I would say is, in many ways, the decision about which school is going to be entrusted with the most important of all decisions, which is who's going to educate your precious, beloved child. Actually, decisions don't get much bigger than that. And of course, you can't press rewind and do it all over again. So the decision you make is an important one. And I want very much, I hope very much, that in these moments together, I might help you think a little bit about the points that I would want to be considering if I were in your shoes. I think, and again, please forgive me for being brutally honest about this, um, I think the first thing you need to consider about is, is school fees. It is a massive investment of your post-tax earnings. And you need to be realistic about whether, not just whether at a stretch you can manage for your one child, but if you're going you know, to go ahead and have a second or a third or a fourth child, you need to be realistic about whether the family coffers, um, you know, you're going to be able to manage to do that without it uh, being a trauma for you all. Because actually what you don't want to do is start the children on one journey and then after a couple of years do the, you know, no, honestly, we just can't do this. And then you backtrack and have to pull them out and then you're looking for a state primary school to send them to. And actually that can cause you all quite a lot of stress. So I guess, as I say, without, uh, without uh, wanting to be too brutal about it, you do need to consider the, the outlay. It is considerable. My husband and Nigel and I, having sent our two boys uh, through the independent sector, we have agreed and resolved that we will never do the sums. We will never work out what it cost, because actually that's too depressing. How many house moves, how many holidays that's cost us, we just don't go there. Um, so I guess that's one I just, I just leave to you. So when you're making this decision, these, are, these, are not, um, you know, these aren't scientific sort of points. These are just points that within, with my experience, both as a mum and as somebody who's taught in a number of different schools and actually who inspect schools. So these points I offer to you for your consideration. And there's no right nor wrong answer to any of them, actually. So the first thing I think you need to consider beyond the fees um, is the whole issue of co-educational single-sex schooling. Now, you know, a case can be made for either of those contexts. And I'm just going to bat this one over the net to you, that I think I can be convinced, I can be persuaded of an argument for single-sex education at the senior level. Actually, I can't be persuaded of it for prep level. I think there is nothing more charming nor delightful than boys and girls forming and establishing friendships with each other, going to each other's birthday parties, holding hands together as they go out to break time. And I think that is a delightful, a delightful thing. And I think in this day and age, would I have wanted my sons 
to have been at an all-boy prep school, go through to an all-boy senior school, and the first time they socially interact with girls was at university. That wouldn't be for me. Now, you, as I say, I'm, I'm offering that up to you to consider. But I don't think that's the real world. I don't think that's, the, I don't think that's right. And I would not want my, my children to be in a single-sex prep school. You might be sitting there thinking, I don't agree with that. And that is absolutely your prerogative. But as I say, I'm just batting these over the net for you to consider. I think you, when you're making this decision, um, so the, the, the single-sex co-ed thing is, is, is an important one. I think you need to consider the next thing, really, is in a sense the academic profile of a prep school. Now, that sounds like an easy consideration, but actually it's much more complicated than you might imagine. A school like mine, and many schools in London, that run a nursery, so we take children age three, well, with the best will in the world, can that be academically selective? Of course it can't be. Now, what I often say to parents is that, of course, um, you know, the gene pool is on their side. Um, they've, uh, they're going to be well taught in, in small classes. So I guess you would say the odds are very much stacked in their favour that they're going to do well academically. But a school that's got a pre-prep, so from age three or four up to age seven, any school that's got a pre-prep as part of its school is going to have a reasonably broad range academically. A school like Sussex House or Collet Court or Westminster Under School, they don't have a pre-prep. So when parents say to me, oh, well, more boys get into Westminster Great School from Westminster Under School than do from Newton Prep, then I'll say, but of course they do. Because the boys that were selected to go to Westminster Under School at 7 plus or 8 plus, Westminster Under are only taking boys who are perhaps academically in the top, what, 5 to 10% of boys of their age group. A school like Newton Prep, alongside, as I say, all of us who run prep schools that also have a pre-prep school, there's going to be a range of academic ability represented at the school. For me, just as I said about the co-ed world, for me that is absolutely right. That's normal, isn't it, that you've got people of a range of abilities. And also the fact is, children of age five, six and seven, for many of them, they're barely out of the starting blocks especially if you factor in summer-born children, and particularly, and both of my boys are summer-born boys, but certainly if you factor in as well the idea of June, July and August-born boys, by the time they turn up to their reception class, you compare them alongside a girl who was born in September or October of the same school year, chalk and cheese, different planets, different points de developmentally, does it mean to say our June, July and August born boys are not going to be as clever and often will outperform those September and Octo October born children later on? Of course it doesn't mean that. But it means give them time. Give them time to develop at their own pace so that when they are ready to go to their senior schools at 11 or at 13, they're absolutely caught up and exceeded and, and, and made up for that sort of slight deficit in those early years, if you like. But I guess you do need to take a view about what a school tells you about itself. So schools, um, I suppose schools like Finton House, Hornsby House, schools like that, those schools have got very big learning support departments because actually both, I mean, they're not, they're not schools that, um, that only specialise in children with um, uh, specific learning difficulties, far from it. They also, as we do at Newton, have a wide range of children um, very bright academically and, and alongside children who need support. But I guess what I would say, you do need to be aware of that. Uh, you need to be aware of whether the school is selling itself. Is it advertising itself as a school that's got a big learning support department? Does it deal well with children with dyslexia, dyscalculia? Are those, are those children going to be well catered for at that school? Now, a school like Newton Prep, if ever you've done any sort of Googling about it, would say that it was, I mean, and it's early, early days, it said it was a school for gifted and talented children. In fact, there was some, some part in its, in, its, in its history where it claimed to be a Mensa school. Well, that's quite clearly ridiculous. How can a school be a Mensa school when it takes children into nursery and reception? But on the other hand, we are a school that's academically ambitious. 
And so what I say to parents when they come and, and a parent tour is you need to be aware of that, that academic ambition is very important here and we don't have a huge learning support department. So that's something that you might need to um, just investigate a little bit. You, and again, when you come to choose a school, as with any important decision, you are coming at the school really through the lens of your own life experience. And for many parents, they will approach the decision about the school their child is going to come to, either with the view that they so loved their own schooling that they're looking for a school that maybe replicates or at least echoes something of their own educational background. Other parents will say, you must be joking. I want something utterly different for my child. There's no way I want my little boy or little girl to have the same sort of educational experience that I had. And actually, I can't answer, and I'm not aiming to answer that question in our moments together. So, but that's an important decision, isn't it? Are you looking for something that's a very traditional sort of prep school? Is it going to have that feel that it did when you were at school? Or even, you know, before that, it sort of, it's got a sort of 50s or 60s sort of feel to it. Is it a sort of school, I mean, what I sometimes say to parents is, are you looking for a blazers and boaters sort of school? Or are you looking for something that feels much more sort of modern, forward-facing? You know, is that the sort of school you're looking for? And you need to be very honest about that. And for some parents, the idea of their children, and again, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not going to make any mistake, and, and any, any um, sort of apology for that, and I'm going to offer that up to you as a consideration. But for instance, even school uniform. For me, I want the children to be wearing a school uniform that doesn't make them look like little businessmen or women. You know, I want them to be able to, I don't want them all trussed up in a furry blazer and a boater anchored on their heads. I actually want them to be able to run and play and be little children and to be themselves. So, and you might, you might have completely the reverse view and you love the notion of, of, of gorgeous school uniforms and it melts your heart and, and that's what you want. So that's, a, that's an important little factor, isn't it? Because it says something about the school. Do you want a school that's got a long and illustrious history or do you want a school that's got a short history and therefore it's, it's a school that, in a sense, has got that forward propulsion rather than a school that's also looking over its shoulder and doffing its cap towards tradition and what's gone before? And I don't know. That, that would be a decision you need to make. I think the physicality, in other words, the location of the school, is another important consideration. Now, living in London, you know, you, it's unlikely when I'm talking about central London schools now, you're not going to get schools with acres of playing fields. Um, but, again, my next little point that I, that I, that I offer up to you, um, we, do something, we do something quite peculiar in London in terms of, you know, that there are many, many sort of converted Victorian houses that have become schools children are being taught in what was once somebody's front bedroom, you know, and they have to sort of shuffle up the stairs on the right and shuffle down on the left because there's, you know, because, it, because it's ordinary staircases. Now, you, again, you might feel that that's of no consequence at all, and that's not a consideration. For me, it is, and for the mother of sons, it is, because I think they would have gone stir-crazy. And I think the idea of the children having somewhere to run and play and run off some of that energy and also, that whole notion of physical um, development is a really important aspect, I think, of their all-round education. And I think phys their physical health is really important. And actually, sadly, I'm afraid, their schooling, even for little children, is stressful. And as we all know, those of us who you know, soldier on and go to the gym or run in the park, we know that actually you know, a, bit of, a bit of physical exercise is a good way to run off some of that stress. Now, you, you may not have that view, but for me, it's important that the children have space where they can play. So you need to look at that, I would suggest. Have a look and see where do they do their sport? Do they come up to Battersea Park, go on to Clapham Common, or is there actually somewhere at the school where they themselves can, um, can, can play and they haven't got to be bussed off-site or crocodiled you know, off-site to play their sport? So I, for me, that's an important consideration. 
I think you need to be realistic about transportation, transport links. With your tiny little children coming into reception in a school, you don't want them to have an hour-long commute. You know, you, you don't want them to be doing that, I don't think. Just getting them up in the morning and getting them out is going to be enough of a challenge for you. So you need to think a little bit. Public transport, obviously, is, is, you know, is a great sell in, in London. Um, there are very few schools that will have their own car parks, and even if they have, you know, just getting onto site is going to be an issue. So I think you need to be realistic. However much you fall in love with a school, you do need to be realistic about can you get there reasonably, either if it's on your way to work um, or close to your home, or that there are excellent public transport routes. And I think that ought to be just a, you know, a really practical consideration. I think you ought to try, if you can, to get some sense of the parent body. What sort of parents send their children to that school? So, um, again, to consider. For me, in London, I think it's really important that their children's schooling represents something of the demographic of living in London. So I would want to know that there are people from a range of cultural, ethnic, religious backgrounds. Because I think, and certainly, you know, in the light of all that's happened in, in Paris this weekend, if there is anything we can do with this generation to learn what it is to be tolerant, to understand each other's differences, to value difference. For me, that is, I, I think that is a, a really, really important soft skill that we send our children off to their senior schools with. And on a practical level, that realistically, your children, they might not even go to university in this country. And beyond that, they are certainly, I would think, incredibly likely to work in cities other than London in their working lives. So therefore, why not start at prep level with the diversity that is represented in our capital city and in cities around the world? But on the other hand, and I, as I often say to parents, I say this bit with the utmost of caution. Some independent schools in this country have become so international that actually they've rather less lost their identity as British prep schools. And for me, I think some middle path is what I think is, is a perfect scenario. And I say that because you would want your children, I think, to make friendships that are likely to go a bit of a distance, not come to the end of each, at each academic year because everybody's shipping off to go elsewhere. And I think you as parents would like to make friendships that are going to go a bit of a distance and not have to keep making new friends. I think you want to look and see, is there an active PTA? Are they welcomed at the school? or not. And you might be very happy for a school where you, you entrust your, the education to the school and you don't expect to play a big part in school life. From my point of view, Newton Prep, we, uh, you know, I meet the co-chairs of the PTA every week. And that's a really important part of my, week, of my weekly diary because I want to know what's going on with the parents, I want to know what the issues are and I want, if at all possible, to address them. I think you need to look at destination schools. Now, if you go on a school's website, they are bound to, they have to display destination schools at 11 or at 13. You need to get a bit of an idea of the sort of schools that these children go off to so that you have an idea of the prep school, but then beyond. So if you go to, for instance, if you choose a prep school where the vast majority of kids go off boarding at 13, but you don't even want to consider boarding, then it would be very silly to send them to a prep school where everybody's going off boarding at 13. So you need to have a little bit of a think about that. You need to think about whether the school's even got age 11 to 13, or whether the school stops at age 11. Because if the school stops at age 11, then boarding for boys is going to be tricky because schools like Eton um, and West Bristol, if they're going boarding, Tunbridge, um, you know, th those schools will, will be wanting them to go boarding at 30, not at 11. And for me, just a, just a little aside, for me, those year sevens and eights, they get so much out of being in a prep school. Two more years in the greenhouse, two more years of being fed and watered and nurtured before they're planted out then into the big world of senior school. And I think that makes perfect sense. Of course, senior schools want to take them at 11. It's a business model. Get them in at 11, money in the bank. But I don't believe educationally it makes sense. I think it's the, the age 11 to 13 in a prep school that makes perfect sense. Last couple of things. 
and then I'll open the floor to some questions. You need to have a look when you're choosing a prep school. Do lots of children leave at age seven or eight? Now, if that, that is the case, then a school like mine is no good because we don't do any preparation for children exiting at seven plus and eight plus because I don't believe it. I don't believe children at seven plus and eight plus are ready to go on to their next schools. So, you, but, if, but if that's what you want, if you want your children trying Westminster under Collet Court City of London Girls Junior School exams at age seven, then you need to go to a pre-prep school where the children are all being prepped for entry to those schools at seven plus and eight plus. So you need to be sort of having it in your mind what you're thinking in that sense. I know it, it's tempting to get sort of completely consumed by the academic progress. And of course, of course, that's primarily what we're there for. Of course it is. But you do need to think about sport and music and drama and art. Because you in your worlds of work will know that the most interesting of your colleagues, of course, they'll be bright and, and you know, intellectually um, interesting people. But when people have got sport to talk about and art to talk about and theatre, that's what we want, isn't it? That we're trying to educate these children in the round. And we're not trying, what I sometimes say to parents, the foie gras approach to teaching. You know, the shove it down their throats because that's what they need for senior school exams. We do have to prepare the children for senior school exams. We would be negligent if we didn't. We're a prep school. It's what we, you know, we are what it says on the tin. We are prepping children for entry to their next stage in their educational lives. But for me, it cannot be about sacrificing education in the broadest sense and having kids just sitting at desks, flogging through past exam papers, the death of learning, the death of real education. I won't tolerate it at my place, but you might say that's exactly what I want. I want them to sit there and flog through those papers because that's the sort of educational experience I want for them. Brackets. I don't believe that's what you'd really want. But, you know, you need to be aware of that, I think, that, uh, of, of what sort of vibe is happening at the school. I think the final thing, perhaps, I would say to you is if you don't get any look-in or any time with the headmaster or headmistress in the process of choosing a prep school, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Because if they delegate the responsibility for admissions to a registrar or to a deputy head, I think that says something about them. And for me, it's, it's hugely important because our relationship, the adults, parents and school, who are going to be charged with the responsibility of the education of your child over those next few years, we need to be in partnership together and therefore you need to know what I'm about and I kind of need to know what you're about. And so for me, admissions coming into the school at whatever age they're coming into Newton Prep is vitally important because it's no good you choosing a school on the basis of a website or what some other parent has told you or what your next door neighbour has said or what a nice registrar has said. If actually you meet me on the first day of term and you think, blimey, didn't know that's what she was like. So, you know, and you need, you need to know, I think. You need to have a bit of a sense of who the headmaster or headmistress is. And as I said, if they won't spend any time with you at the point of entry into school, I think that, sends, that would send alarm bells. Because what happens then if your child, when they start preparing for senior school entry, are they going to give you time then? What if your child is unhappy? Are they going to give you time then? So if they don't give you time at the most important point, which is entry to the school, I think that just says something about the sort of leader you've got at that school. Now I'm away, I, I'm aware I've chirruped away for the last uh, half an hour or so. Um, we've got um, about five minutes, um, if there are any questions that you would like to ask from the floor. If there aren't any questions from the floor, then I'll, I'll just go and stand and, and, and take questions if you just want to come up and, um, and have a chat afterwards. While well, Alison swigs some water quickly, um, can I just say that it would be really good if you could make your questions short and sharp and not too personal. Um, I'm sure Alison would be very pleased to answer any personal questions afterwards, but questions of general principle would be great. Who's got the first one? We have a roving mic. Um, I hope we have it. Yes, we do. Hello. Hello. 
Can you tell us anything about the trans... If, if we, one was to choose to start at state primary and then move into yep. independent... That's a very good question, and a number of parents will do that. will say, well, look, we're going to start at our local primary school. It, it makes sense socially, it makes sense logistically, all sorts of reasons. So, again, many prep schools then will run an entry at 7+, plus. so when children want to come into year 3 or year 4. And, again, I can't speak for all headmasters and headmistresses of prep schools... But when I'm looking, what I will look at their educational backgrounds so far. Um, they, will do, they will certainly come and do some, um, se some selective exams, and then they will come for interview. And what I would want to be satisfied is, are they going to fit within what I've got? Are they, if they were way off the pace, and there is what I describe as clear water between them and everybody else, then... Then, we, then, then I probably wouldn't take them. But provided they fit within what we've got, um, then, then you know, those, sort of, those sort of exams are... And again, I can't speak for the whole world of prep school heads and headmasters out there, but I guess the way I describe it is it's, it's, um, it's a compassionate system in the sense that I bear in mind where they have previously been at school, I bear in mind whether they're a summer-term born child... Um, and look at um, a, a little bit about their potential. That's one of the reasons that verbal and non-verbal reasoning is useful, because those reasoning exams are meant to be an indication of a child's underlying ability rather than a test of what they've been taught in their school up to date. So, okay. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Could, could, we, could you tell a bit more about start in, in private sector and then consider state for, for the secondary. So doing it that way around, in, investing in the, in the prep and then... OK, so, the, and again, that's a decision some people will make, that actually what they're going to do is they're going to put their investment into prep um, age, level, uh, age um, education so that the children um, have a, a good, a really good start, um, and then they go out to state schools. It happens. Um, I would say, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you, Areas like Kent, where there's uh, 11 plus, um, is, is, is a slightly different thing, and, and a number of children will, will certainly jump out to the state sector. I suppose schools that are around here, Battersea, Wandsworth, and in central London, not so many will go out to state school at 11, but it doesn't mean to say that they can't make that transition um, and make it very successfully, actually. Hi. Um, what do you mean by British prep school, uh, say vis-a-vis -vis an international school, for instance? I suppose what I mean is that, um, and again, that's, that's, a, that's quite a, a big question with quite a long answer, and I, so I'll say a couple of things. When I say that some schools have become so international that they cease to feel like a British prep school, the key thing I'm saying really is about the mobility of the, of the parent body. So people coming for two or three years and going, and then a new group of parents coming. So it's the very mobile parent population. Um, and that means that inevitably it loses that, um, that stability, I suppose. Beyond that, um, but, but yeah, I won't say too much about that. I suppose it's, uh, it's, marking, it's marking occasions that are important in the, in, in the life of this country um, so that you know, we will, we will certainly do units of work about democracy, houses of parliament, um, at school like, like mine, I, I suppose, we, Michael Gove came and spoke to my parents and older pupils on Wednesday evening. Um, Rosella mentioned the conference I had on empowering women where Nikki Morgan, Secretary of State for Education, came and spoke, um, and uh, Sir Alan Parker, film director, came and spoke to our children, because actually something about the hinterland of what it is to be um, citizens here in Britain or living in Britain, I think is an important part of what we want them to go away with. But I'm certainly not talking about making children... I mean, we've also celebrated this week Diwali, and, and two weeks ago celebrated Eid. Um, and so I'm, I'm not talking about only doing things that are British, but I'm saying about giving people some... giving the children an idea of the heritage of this country, I suppose. Does that, does that sort of... Uh, what uh, advice could you offer for um, uh, parents that are returning from abroad and therefore their children are already, shall we say, in the, in the middle of uh, two age groups? Yeah. 
that can be quite tricky, can't it, for parents? And, I, and uh, it's one of the things you will do is you'll have to um, do quite a lot of research to find out if there are occasional places available at, at various schools. Um, and a little bit depends how old they are. So, I mean, again, let me speak from, from my perspective. If a child is, say, age 10, let me give you an example, um, particularly a girl, because as you know, in this country, girls tend to make the transition to their senior schools at age 11, unless they're going off boarding. Then, um, if they're really bright, and actually getting a London day place one year after they come to the prep school, then, then absolutely no problem about them coming. If they come and their educational background has given them loads of other things, but it, but it actually leaves them a little bit short of what they need for 11 plus or uh, for 11 plus exams, then what I say to parents is, look, if you're willing to stay to 13 and we've got a bit longer to work with them, then we would love to have them. So for me, and I guess I, I'm sure that would be the case with lots of prep heads, is it's very much more of a conversation on a one-on-one -on -one basis Talk to me about your children. How old are they? What's been their educational experience? Come and do some assessments. Let me see where they are in relation to other children I've got here. What are you thinking about next? Is boarding on the, on the agenda at all? Because if boarding's on the agenda, there are many, many options. If it has to be London Day, there are fewer options. And it has to be that sort of, co a, a kind of a bespoke conversation, I would say. You're just gonna have to do a bit more legwork about finding out which schools have got, uh, have got um, places available. Right, we've got time for one more quick question. Who, yeah? Yeah, hi. Um, just one question and piece of advice you have for parents who are not necessarily uh, English their native language and therefore educate their children with, with multiple languages. Yeah. I mean, how, how much are you looking at fluent English at the um, age of three when they obviously go to prep school? Yeah. I mean, what a wonderful thing, isn't it, for children to be bi or trilingual and, as we're, and we're seeing, you know, so much of that and we, you know, we indigenous Brits who struggled with sort of, you know, O-level French some years ago, you know, it, it shames me really. But uh, so, so in the broadest sense, it's a wonderful thing that they've got multiple languages in their brains. But it does mean that when, they've, when they're first learning to speak and first learning to read and write, the sort of different languages in their brain does mean, of course, that actually their written English and their, and their uh, reading can be delayed. For me, actually, I'm quite happy to take children into nursery or even into reception um, with limited English. And, um, and because actually they, uh, they assimilate English very fast. It, it is more problematic the older the children are. So if they come to me at age 10, to go back to your point about uh, having been um, in overseas educational backgrounds, if they turn up at age 10 and have got limited English, then I've got a problem. Because I haven't got a big English as an additional language department. I've got some, but not lots. And we know then the clock is ticking as far as 11 plus or 13 plus exams. Little ones, not a problem, it, for, for, in my view.